which is the midweek portion of our transatlantic slavery symposium and this has been a focus a wonderful collaboration between benjamin franklin house in london and two of the premier founder institutions uh, monticello and mount vernon so the theme here is about public programming and interpreting slavery in the founding era. That is what we're going to be focusing on today. Let me just first introduce myself. I'm the director, actually the founding director of Benjamin Franklin House. That's located in the center of London, and it is Benjamin Franklin's only surviving home anywhere in the world. It was derelict for about 25 years before we opened for the first time on Franklin's 300th birthday in 2006. And we have since welcomed um, uh, well over 140,000 visitors. And we do three things. We focus on education for young people. We also have a scholarship center, which is the Robert H. Smith Scholarship Center. And we offer public programming like this event this evening. And then we also have our historical experience, which is presenting our space uh, through a piece of theater and also using technology that Benjamin Franklin, who said he was born a couple hundred years too soon and something would be made of his passion for technology and innovation, would surely have loved. And it's relevant for our discussion this evening. And you're in for a treat because I have two amazing colleagues that I wanna introduce you to now. I'd like to start with Brandon Dillard. And Brandon is the manager of historic interpretation at Monticello. He trains and supports staff, and he also acts as an institutional representative to help others understand how race, class, and gender and power intersect with the construction of public memory and the creation of historical narratives. He's also associated with getting the word out um, getting, getting Word, which is an oral history project in various capacities uh, since 2013. And Brenda Parker is our other colleague who is the coordinator of African American interpretation and special projects at Mount Vernon. She serves as the liaison between the institution's mission to preserve, maintain, and restore, and the descendants of the enslaved at Mount Vernon. She has developed programs such as Lives, Loves, and Losses, Remembering the Families, and she's also a historical character interpret interpreter, where she narrates the stories of multiple persons, individually or collectively, in story format, such as her play entitled Freedom Skies. So uh, welcome, Brandon. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks so much. Well, Brenda, with my introduction and you piqued our interest, um, tell us a little bit about your play, Freedom Skies, and, and what characters are you interpreting? Oh, excellent, I'd be happy to. Um, um, the play, Freedom Skies, it takes place on January 1st, 1801, which is the date that um, Martha Washington decided to amanuement her former husband's enslaved persons here, 123 different persons. I tell the stories of four individual persons, um, the, that of the story of Frank and Lucy Lee, um, Frank Lee being the head butler to the mansion house, Lucy Lee being taught and trained as a chef, as well as Sambo Anderson, who was a skilled carpenter who lived and worked on Mount Vernon um, and his wife, uh, lived and worked down on another farm, a neighboring farm, as well as the story of, of oh, excuse me, Caroline Branham, <laughs> who's my primary primary narrative um, person that I narrate around here um, on a regular basis. And this tells the, the, the conflicting or the contrasting um, emotions of that particular day to whether a small portion of the enslaved community there were receiving their freedom and the other portion was not. And it's all told um, through the story of, um, with the uh, musical song of I'll Fly Away, 
um, interspersed um, in between the different characters that I present. Um, present. Um, I'm actually presenting four different persons. Yeah, it gets a little crazy, but um, <laughs> it's a beautiful and heart wrenching and a deep look into the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions that might have gone through these persons' lives on a day such as important and monumental as that particular day was. And um, also giving the viewers or the people that, you know, that come to see it or to listen to it, also an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about the world that was then, as well as um, everything else that was going on at that particular time and then also into the future because um, these persons are, you're able to track these persons lives if you go to our exhibit of Lives Bound Together. A lot of these persons are also featured in that particular exhibit. Wonderful. We might ask you to do some singing for us then later. That would be, <laughs> that'd be a real treat. Um, Brandon, I'm curious, uh, how did you come to work at Monticello and um, what is it about your role that you really enjoy? So uh, I started working at Monticello much by happenstance. Uh, I am a first generation college student, which means I didn't have a whole lot of uh, guidance on what to do in my undergraduate career. And philosophy seemed like a great idea, so I studied philosophy. And I graduated right before the Great Recession, and none of the philosophy firms hired me. So I was a bartender for a very long time. Uh, and I traveled around various places uh, attending bar. And I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, where my sister lived, uh, working at a local restaurant. And I answered an ad in a newspaper that was hiring part-time tour guides at Monticello. Um, I've always been interested in history. It seemed like an interesting day job to go with my service career in the evening. And then over the next few years, I quickly learned that this is something that I was quite passionate about. And it allowed me to combine the joys of uh, working with people and serving people and talking with people that I got to do behind a bar uh, with some of the more academic stuff that I was unable to exercise uh, that I left behind in my undergraduate career. So I did it for a few years part time and then uh, started doing it full time and have since continued my studies, I uh, got a graduate degree in social cultural anthropology and I focus on memory. And uh, over time, quickly found that the stories that drew me most at Monticello uh, were the stories of human perseverance and the ways in which uh, people managed to enact those ideas that were first put forth in the founding of this nation. You know, these beautiful ideals of freedom and, and liberty and self-governance that were so unrealized in those founding uh, days. And that the stories that most resonated with me are the stories of people who managed to make them true for the lives of themselves and their descendants, uh, whether enslaved or indigenous or in some way marginalized. There are so many aspects of American history uh, that we can tell in new ways, uh, parts of the story that have yet to be told. That's very exciting. Well, let me just remind our audience what we're going to be doing um, over the course of the next hour. We will be chatting um, on a very important theme about how we address uh, slavery and the history of enslaved peoples as it relates to our respective institutions. We're going to be talking until about, um, I don't know, a little past uh, half of the hour. And we invite you to be formulating and getting your questions in because we definitely want to hear from you and your thoughts and the questions that you have for my two distinguished guests. So I wanted to start maybe back to you, Brandon. You know, how has Monticello historically addressed the issue of slavery um, and you know, the presentation of that story to your visitors? You know, much like Mount Vernon, uh, Monticello has been open to the public for a pretty long time. Uh, we, are, we are rapidly approaching the centennial. Uh, we opened as a historic house museum in 1923. And I think that anybody with the institution would tell you that it's been a long process, uh, a process of, of learning and uh, changing the ways in which slavery is presented to the public. And uh, much of that process has involved the people who uh, are telling the stories. Uh, 
And over time, it's been a, a number of different guides who've worked at Monticello. And in the early years, the first interpreters were mostly African-American men who lived in the community of Charlottesville. And the stories that they told at Monticello uh, can be hard to track down exactly what the scripts were. I've yet to find one from the 1920s or 30s. Mm -hmm. But I have found anecdotal uh, where people have written to uh, the foundation talking about how much they enjoyed their tours. And then I think that there was a process in the mid 20th century that involved uh, some ideas about professionalizing the field and what that meant. And the tour shifted from having a, a stories about people focused to stories about decorative arts. And I think that when that happened, there was also a shift towards who was telling those stories. And at the time, uh, in the 1950s, the institution shifted from having African-American men work there, they replaced them with white women, largely, who would tell stories mostly about the physical objects of the house. And if you were to visit Monticello in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, I'm not sure what you would have heard about slavery. Uh, but I can say that it would not have been the kind of direct or engaging conversation that we would have today. And I can say that even in my time, I would not be able to do the work that I do if not for the work of many people who've come before me. And starting in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, so much work done by uh, public historians, educators, curators, archaeologists, just so many people who've worked on bringing the stories of people who were enslaved at Monticello central to the discussion itself. Monticello is un uncommon in the ways in which uh, the people who were enslaved there, their lives were recorded and then preserved because of their association with a founding figure. And also Jefferson's relationships with the people who he held in bondage were uncommon. And most notably his sexual relationship with Sally Hemings and the production of children in that relationship has been in the public eye for a long time. For over 20 years, that conversations about the relationship between Jefferson and Hemings have been central to our mission and they're included on every tour. And I would say that over the last 10 years, the public consciousness abroad, you know, and this is the larger civic conversations of people in the United States have changed about the ways that people will readily grapple with race and legacies of racism associated with transatlantic slavery and what that means. And so now, the emphasis on the individual stories of people who were enslaved at Monticello is key to understanding the place, but it's also integral to our interpretation that the visitors who come there understand that the reasons why these stories matter so much is because the world in which we live today and some of the troubles that we're still trying to unravel with post-colonialism and racism directly stem to this long arc of transatlantic slavery. So Brenda, for you at Mount Vernon, what has you know, historically been the way that history was presented? Oh, goodness. Here at Mount Vernon, I believe it was a tiny bit of a similar start in that um, a good majority of the employees that were here um, initially when the Mount Vernon Ladies Association opened it up um, for a visitation, were actually descendants of um, enslaved persons. And so you have people like, um, oh, forgive me, I can't think of his name right now, William Holland, I believe it was, who was the original um, tomb keeper, so to speak. And he would position himself down at the tomb, at the new tomb of General George Washington and tell all those wonderful little tales about, you know, how he was there and how his father did this and his, you know, his brother did that. Again, telling those stories of nostalgia, you know, and trying to, you know, engage the visitors on response, as well as also, you know, I guess entertain them slightly in an effort to um, receive monetary compensation in the, in the form of a tip or a gratuity. Um, there's a wonderful story that was told by the descendant of Mr. William Holland, um, where he said he would tape a dollar to the inside of his cap and at the end of his presentation or spill, he would bow and tip, <laughs> tip his cap forward. And that was everybody's opportunity to give him a little tribute. Um, he also, um, I believe it was sold um, wooden canes from, from the trees 
that were around. So you also have to think about this in terms of what was the world, what was society offering to an older black person, a um, person that was formerly enslaved in society? What were their means of you know, making a living and taking care of their family? and things of that particular sort. There's um, a couple of other um, people that were working inside of the mansion house and around the estate. Sarah Johnson had a whole entire book written about her. It's called Sarah Johnson's Mount Vernon, um, where I found out so many different interesting um, um, facts and stories about the original um, persons that were, you know, receiving people in for the tours and things of that particular nature. I believe that the the regents, the Board of Regents, the Mount Vernon um, regents and everything, they might have been giving some tours initially, um, but as far as grounds um, maintenance, as far as, you know, um, upkeep of the property and gardening and things of that particular nature, even cooking and um, and things of that particular sort, a lot of it was done by formerly, you know, descendants of formerly enslaved people, if they weren't actually themselves descendants, um, if they weren't themselves formerly um, just enslaved as well. So we have that, that beautiful history as well. And very similar to what happened there at Monticello, it did evolve. Once we um, transitioned into more of the material aspects or the more material culture, um, that's again when you know, the presentation of those persons presenting it, you know, less and less people were coming for that particular, you know, you know, the stories of way back when, you know, the nostalgia of it, and more and more people were coming, you know, to look at the artifacts, to look at the fine china, to look at, you know, the teas, um, tea sets and things of that particular sort which were still connected to those persons <laughs> that were there originally. And that's the whole premise of our Lives Bound Together exhibit, is that we take a very closer look at um, those particular objects and connect those objects to persons and those persons to stories and to a community and to the world at large here. Well, it's really interesting because uh, for both of your institutions, it really started with an oral history, didn't it? Um, yes. As a way of telling stories that had been passed down for Benjamin Franklin House, because we had been built as a lodging house, and that's how Franklin got there, although he was said to be less a lodger than the head of a household living in serene comfort and affection, you can imagine. <laughs> it was really, he turned it into his house. He had a wonderful landlady and, and her daughter. Uh, who, and in fact, the daughter is our principal character when you come to see our historical experience. But I'm, I'm curious um, if we can go back, Brenda, tell us about George Washington and his position on slavery. Because we think we know our characters, that we as um, citizens, as I'm, a, I'm based here in London, and I'm a, a, a proud British subject, but I'm also a proud American citizen, actually born on the 4th of July, so it's rather fitting that I have a job I do. Um, but, but we don't often know as much as we think we do. Um, I guess when I started, I knew Benjamin Franklin was a guy who was rather portly with um, a mullet and some bifocals and maybe something about a kite, didn't know really all that much more. But um, tell us, Brenda, what about George George Washington? Where where did he sit on this? Oh goodness, his views on the institution, the peculiar institution, as it was called, um, they most definitely evolved in his lifetime, and I have. Um, no doubt or what I've been presented and what I've uncovered as, as far as my research, uh, but things that his, his views on the institution started to change along with um, about the time of the Revolutionary War, maybe a little bit before then, but it was very highly influenced by his relationships with people like um, um, Alexander Hamilton, John Lawrence, Marquis de Lafayette, um, you know, all of these people, even William Lee, his enslaved um, manservant was also very instrumental in, um, in his changing views. Uh, there are a lot of quotes that I use when people come 
<laughs> when they address me, I'm not going to say confront, when they <laughs> address me and I'm in character um, concerning Washington as being a, a slaveholder and everything. And they'll say, you know, it's like, um, you know, well, how can he own, you know, slaves or this, that, and the other. And, you know, in an attempt not to make an excuse for his choices, I'm just stating the fact um, Washington was known as saying, there's not a man greater than myself that wishes to see for the slow, gradual abolition of it. But I fear that it will not come about except for by legislation. Um, he says, on um, the subject of slavery, I fear that it's a subject of unavoidable regret. Um, you know, things of this particular nature. Um, he also said, um, he was talking about uh, the institution itself and, and recognizing and realizing and claiming his part in it, saying, calling the, you know, um, the enslaved people, he says, you know, I, I have um, concerns about these persons who are in this un unfortunate condition, whom, whom, whose labor I benefit from, I profit from. So he absolutely knew what he was doing. And then he tried to make well, he didn't try to make. He made decisions that either supported his thought to, you know, to gradually emancipate them or to free them, or either he made some decisions that were further reinforcing the institution or supporting the institution. Um, case in point, the Fugitive Slave um, uh, Act or law that he signed into being while he was, you know, as president, which states that you can go into any slaveholding territory and retrieve your property in humans. Uh, Brendan, um, how about Mr. Jefferson? Because you mentioned about his relationship with Sally Hemings. And we know that you know, he was sometimes, uh, he, was, he was a reluctant figure. At, at times, wasn't he um, reluctant to uh, play the roles that he often played? I mean, maybe he would have been very happy to have been, you know, a gentleman farmer um, and an inventor um, in Monticello. But um, where where was he, and what can we glean uh, for the relationship with with Sally? Was he was this an exploitative relationship, or was this um, one where you know, except for the times in which in which they lived, you know, he uh, held her in great esteem, and you know, he things might have turned out differently, um, you know, in in another period of history. Yeah, so you know, when when looking at Jefferson or um, or Washington or any of these figures, I think it's interesting to note how many of them talked about the duties of public office as something that they have. Uh, something that was a uh, part of this, uh, uh, you know, classical sense of this is a duty that one does for their government, but not something that one seeks. Meanwhile, all of them are constantly placing themselves in situations where they get elected to do these kinds of things, which I think is interesting and speaks a little bit to some of the American political character that evolves throughout. And I would also say the same thing about um, this whole generation of enslavers, you know, to underscore some of Brenda's point here. Uh, the they didn't say that slavery was good. You know, you, almost universally, they denounced the institution as an evil, and that's true for Jefferson throughout the course of his life. He said that slavery was, you know, a, a moral and political uh, depredation. Like this was something that he thought was wrong and it should go away. However. Uh, he also personally benefited a great deal from enslaving people at Monticello. And this is something that visitors grapple with quite a bit. They want to know, you know, I'd say the number one questions are the one that Brenda mentioned, which is, you know, how could he do this? How could he say all men are created equal and yet own people? And the other is that some various version of this question, you know, was he a good slaveholder? And then trying to meet people enough to say, you know, there is no such thing as a good slaveholder. So what's the real question? And the question is, were people beaten? Were people exploited? Were people, you know, were they treated as property? And the answer is yes. Yes. And the answer is always yes for every person who ever benefited off of the enslavement of any other person, because the entire institution is that. I think what makes Jefferson interesting is that he knew that and he knew that it was wrong. 
And of course, notably, he also uh, was quite intellectual and was arguing through some of the ideas that were being discussed by these Enlightenment figures and ideas about race specifically on notes on the state of Virginia. Thomas Jefferson did not seek to rationalize enslavement, but he did explain it. Uh, and he did that by talking about people based on the colors of their skins and whether or not they were superior or inferior based on that. And much of the racism that develops co-developed along with capitalism and transatlantic slavery. This is part of it. And Jefferson is part and parcel to that. As for the latter question uh, about Hemings and Jefferson's relationship, I think that it is absolutely paramount in any conversation and talking about that to first establish that the very idea of consent between a master and a slave is an absurdity mm -hmm. and that any kind of ability for Hemings to say no is not something that we can really fathom in modern terms. That being said, Sally Hemings should not be viewed exclusively as someone who was a victim of her situation. And we can't say necessarily what her feelings were about the relationship. We can say that consent wasn't part of it, but I can't tell you how she felt about Jefferson. And because of his privacy, I can't tell you how he felt about her. I can say that yes, it was exploitative by its very nature. Uh, I can say that it also resulted in the births of children and that many of those children have many descendants today. And the descendants who are alive today disagree with each other about the nature of the relationship and what it was like. Historians disagree about the nature of the relationship. And whereas I can say it was based on a gross imbalance of power and a monumental age difference, I also have to underscore that I cannot say with certainty how Sally Hemings felt about anything and doing so denies her the exact same agency she was denied in life by enslavement. That's fascinating and very thoughtful. Uh, let me just tell you both and our listeners a little bit about my understanding of Benjamin Franklin and his involvement with slavery. Uh, he was born in Boston in 1706 and even though that was uh, the north of colonial America as it still remains um, in the northeast, uh, he was, I would say, accepting of this institution. He was a product of his time, and uh, we can see that he actually, when he uh, eventually goes to Philadelphia, and uh, after spending some initial time in London as a, as a very young man, he wouldn't come back again until, um, you know, in much different circumstances uh, in his uh, late 40s uh, to be the most famous colonial, um, having had Poor Richard's Almanac um, as one of his uh, offerings, which kind of was a colonial equivalent to a bestseller. But he, we can see his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, had many advertisements and um, uh, yes, yeah, mostly ads um, that you know he obviously profited by and his newspaper profited from in terms of having um, access to capital by those advertisements. And you know, he has this trajectory, and I thought that was quite interesting, um, what you were saying, Brenda, about you know, kind of starting out one way and then um, evolving in his views. So when Franklin does come back to London in 1757, he doesn't uh, he goes back briefly between 1762 and 1764, but doesn't leave again until um, the early part of 1775 when um, the Revolutionary War is just kind of kicking off in, in earnest. Over that time period, he has changed his thinking. And I had an example of that um, when I was looking at how he was talking about the institution. And uh, he he's writing, um, when he comes to Craven Street, he actually has two black servants who are with him. And, and one of them is uh, goes off um, because when you came onto British soil, you were free because uh, the institution of slavery was never legalized in, in Britain although Britain would profit from the slave trade until it was formally abolished in, in the early 1800s uh, by 1806, 1807. 
Um, so he's writing in a, in a letter to his wife about um, his black servant, Peter, who comes uh, with him. And he gets a sense of a kind of friendship. He says, Peter continues with me and behaves as well as I can expect in a country where there are many occasions of spoiling servants if they are ever so good. He has a few faults and I see them with only one eye and I hear only with one ear. So we rub on pretty comfortably. He goes on in this letter to talk about how his other servant, King, had gone off and um, was finding his own way in England and um, had found kind of a good situation as a, as a servant and uh, was being educated. And uh, he also comments that uh, he was taught to read and write, to play the violin and the French horn, and some other accomplishments more useful in a servant. But um, it isn't until 10 years later that he is um, referencing Grenville Sharp, who was a, a uh, dynamic uh, British individual who uh, was really uh, a pioneering uh, abolitionist and so we began to see uh, a change in his uh, his approach and and his thinking he also was co-opted to be part of something called the Bray Associates with another historical uh, figure uh, Dr. Johnson uh, he of dictionary fame and that was about educating former uh, blacks um, enslaved people. And so uh, this is beginning to augment and, and change his, his views. He also had a friend, a gentleman um, named Dr. Richard Price, who was a philosopher and a nonconformist and who also influenced his views um, on the practice of slavery. And so when we get to the end of the, of the Revolutionary War, we have a situation um, in which Franklin returns back to Philadelphia to close out his days. And his last public act, his last formal role, is to serve as the president of the Pennsylvania Society uh, for the Promotion of the Abolition of Slavery. And then he is um, writing using the techniques that he's used throughout his career, like uh, having pen names and coming up with treatises and different ways of trying to convince his audience of his subject, in this case, that uh, slavery was an abomination and it needed to end. So we have a complicated situation because we cannot forgive uh, or brush over those years in which he profited from this institution. Um, so how do we present this and, and do that appropriately? Uh, so it's something that we are we are thinking about. We have on our, our plans to uh, revamp and reinvigorate our uh, the space at Benjamin Franklin House, which is a wonderful, quirky Georgian uh, building which was originally like two up two down so we're not talking about you know the great beautiful spaces that you have respectively at Mount Vernon and Monticello but um, in in our space which we call our uh, introductory seminar room we're, we're going to be thinking about this and we want to do this right so you're a little bit farther on your respective journeys so kind of Brandon you talked a little bit about you know how things have changed and and it was similar with what Brenda said about focusing on the objects instead of the stories for a big chunk of time in the 20th century. But how how has has this accelerated in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement? And what do you see for the future? And Brenda, I'll be curious to find out from you as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that one of the things that Brenda said that I, I liked is that the, the stuff is also really important. Like you gotta tie the stories of the people to the stuff. And, uh, you know, any, any one of us could go give a lecture in a classroom that doesn't have any historical tie to these these important places where history happens. But I think all of us do what we do because we love the places themselves and because they, they, they hold this memory. You know, even when it's a painful memory, it's important to learn from it. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a process that we're still engaging in and it will always be a process. And I'm certain that there are things that I'm saying and writing today that 20 years from now, people will be highly critical of, and I welcome that. 
All I hope is that I have the humility and the wherewithal to grow with that critique over time. And I hope that all of our institutions in the field will do so as well. And I think that by its nature, it's comprised of people who are inquisitive and who want to do not only what is uh, interesting and what teaches us about the past, but what helps us advance as societies forward. And I think that, you know, the last part of your question there, particularly working out of Charlottesville, Virginia, over the last few years, obviously there have been many conversations about race and what that means. And I think that there's evidence of that and what that conversation looks like in the public sphere that is, is evident to anyone who is watching this today, look at comments, like watch comments and watch how people quickly devolve into arguments with each other about how transatlantic slavery was not about race. Uh, which shows a clear misunderstanding of the evolution of what racism is, as well as the evolution of transatlantic slavery and capitalism and how all of those things result today in the world in which we live. And in many ways, we're still seeing these ongoing plantation logics that lead to things like climate change and extractive global economies today and racism that still persists that has such a clear tie. So yes, I would say that Black Lives Matter has certainly impacted what we are talking about because it's one of the most important civil rights movements in the history of the world. But I would also say that all public discourse that looks at these conversations and is starting to reckon in the ways in which race and power and memory tie together is becoming more public and, and more common. You know, academics have been talking about this stuff for decades and decades, but now read about it on Facebook. And so I think it's interesting to watch the ways that, that people come with so much more uh, knowledge and baggage and thoughts about this stuff than even when I started uh, giving tours 11 years ago. It's, it's a different time, and in some ways it's harder, but I think in a lot of ways it means that the work itself is so much more important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brenda? I have to agree with um, you, Brandon, on that where, yes, the work is it's definitely much more harder. Um, I, I feel it every single day, every single week and when you come here and it is part of everybody's emotion or their feeling. Um, I was introduced to um, the first rendition or the altered rendition of our Enslaved People of Mount Vernon tour. Um, our incredible um, director of interpretation, Jeremy um, Ray, um, he invited us in and, and I'm a character interpreter and knowing that I would never give that particular tour, but he invited myself and my colleague at the time, Jonathan Woods, and we went over there and he was introducing, um, he was trying to talk about people's mental faculties or where they are, where they stand emotionally, you know, the, the general visitors of the guests that we get here. And so we were um, he presented to us, you know, um, the graphic of the, the stages of grief. And ever since that, ever since I, I grasped hold of that concept, it's easier for me to know how to address the visitor in the response that they're, you know, that they hope to receive from me in the questions that they have. So I understand when somebody says, but, you know, he was good. Yeah, that's the one. But he was good, right? Um, um, so he was nice to them. Um, he didn't beat them, right? And it was like, uh, no, those things happened here. And he might not have been the person holding the whip, but he was very well, uh, you know, aware of, you know, the person that did it and, and the reasons why that person did, you know, that particular thing. But I think the thing that is assisting me in my my journey and my job here is trying to present the intersectionality between these two different worlds or all of the different worlds. And so with the program that I created, Lives, Loves and Losses, remembering the families, the intersectionality met at death, you know, it, it met at life in itself. <laughs> it, it met at, you know, at, you know, at love, all of those different things. And so I'm presenting this particular family and saying they were a family. This was a wife. This was a mother. This was a father. This was a husband. These were children. These were siblings. And then you look at the Washington family. She was a wife. She was a mother. 
these were sisters, these were brothers, these were siblings, you know, and then you look larger. This was a community. This was a household. This was a neighborhood. And so when people can identify themselves in the story, it kind of removes the, you know, the color or the, the class system away from them. And then that restores humanity. I think that's what the challenge, I honestly think that that's what I'm up against every single day is restoring the humanity to my American ancestors, to these people that were before me, you know, and if they can see the humanity in these persons and not see them as, you know, a piece of property, a piece of movable property, then maybe they can understand why we're out there in the streets pushing to say these Black lives matter instead of saying, well, all lives matter <laughs> until these black lives <laughs> are recognized as being humans, <laughs> until they're recognized as having feelings and experiencing pain and love and laughter and joy and separation the exact same way as the persons who enslaved them did, then they won't matter. And <laughs> we're just saying, that they all, you know, these Black lives matter then and they matter today. Simple as that. So. Yeah. We're three institutions that are collaborating on this topic, but have either of you been reaching out to other uh, museum colleagues and, you know, what's happening in those conversations and activities? <sighs> Yes, I, and, and we have here, um, recently I believe a trip was made down to Colonial Williamsburg, um, even though they're a much different format than we are, um, we're trying to collaborate with them in some efforts to try to understand um, the ways that they did um, training for their character actors and the people that come in direct um, contact with a lot of the visitors um, inquiries and, and questions and things of that particular, um, yeah, that particular sort. And so I know that was the, the most recent thing. We've also made it a trip up there to visit Brandon <laughs> at Monticello um, a couple of times as well. So we're, we're trying to use um, collaborative forces as much as possible and not reinvent the wheel <laughs> and say, did that work for you guys? <laughs> you <know? laughs> or why don't you try this and let us know how it works out. <laughs> and Brandon, for you, um, the I would just like connection with um, Mount Vernon. Oh uh, yeah, I would just agree with Brenda. I, I think that, uh, you know, surprisingly, there is like a whole field of organizations that are Virginia Presidential Historic Plantation Homes. So there are quite a few of us right in the surrounding area that work together uh, quite a bit, you know, and Montpelier and Highland are just here in town. Um, so, you know, working with Mount Vernon, the, you know, the, the four sites have worked together many times over the years. A lot of us are, are very close with each other. Uh, which is one of the reasons I think why uh, we were so excited to join this because we're able to have a conversation with you all on the other side of the Atlantic. And I think that uh, in my experience over the last couple of years, this has increasingly been uh, a major topic of conversation for historic sites all over the, all over the country uh, and the ways in which uh, the transatlantic slave trade impacted the founding of America is something that is universal. And so places as, as far and wide as, you know, Whitney Plantation in Louisiana is doing great work, McLeod in South Carolina is doing great work, and even places that might not seem like the connection is, is uh, clear, places like uh, Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, there, there are conversations there about the ways that race intersects with incarceration and what that means today. So uh, I'd say across the board, everybody is having these conversations throughout the field. I've got a couple of great audience questions, and let me just remind our listeners, please send these in so that we can ask uh, Brandon and Brenda you know, for their thoughts. But this question uh, someone has written in to know, what kind of responses do you get from the guests at your institutions, and, and how do you walk that line in terms of interpretations? 
Um, one of my favorite responses is when people say, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> and that's all we want to do is to give them a different perspective, <laughs> a different viewpoint, instead of making it a singular story all the time, because there's a challenge, there's a problem that's problematic altogether when it's a, a single story or a single narrative. Yeah. Um, and that's what I, I most hope to hear from any visitor is just, you know, I never, I never thought about it that way, or I didn't know that, you know, or can you tell me more? <laughs> Where can I get more information? And then I'm quick to give them a list of books <laughs> and send them to the museum. <laughs> Wonderful. How about for you, Brandon? You know, we do a uh, we do a lot of visitor surveys. I know that's something that all of us do across the field. Uh, you know, answers have changed, but statistically, when you break it down, it it looks much the same. So, to answer what kind of responses, about fifteen percent of people say that we do not talk about slavery at all, uh, that we whitewash the institution, and uh, shame on us for doing such a poor job of that. About 15% of people say that all we ever talk about is slavery and that we don't talk about Jefferson at all and shame on us for doing that. And then about 70% of people say, this is really interesting. I learned something that I didn't expect. And I think that so long as we can you know, have these outliers to learn from, have the majority of people to see what's actually happening uh, with most of our interpretive programs, then we know that we are meeting our visitors where they are and engaging them in those conversations. And something that Brenda said that really resonated for me that I think is so true is that it is so paramount for this work to, to focus it on the individual stories of people. You know, if I can talk about statistics and numbers and I can talk about the brutality of the institution, but when I tell a specific story about James Hubbard or David and Isabel Hearn or Jupiter Evans, you know, or Sally Hemings, uh, visitors, they, they want to learn more about the person. And when they learn more about the person, they learn more about the, the processes and the history overall. And so the key for us is always focusing on the agency, but using that as a way to get into the harder conversations about the paradox itself and the legacies that remain. So we have a question about the actual interpretation. So how are you telling those stories? So I think, um, uh, Brenda, you mentioned about uh, the uh, discussion, some of the tours that you lead, as well as your play. Um, Brandon, you've mentioned as well the kind of one-on-one -on -one engagement, but in terms of the physical display, what's happening with that? Um, here at Mount Vernon, we just closed, after it was up for six years, I believe it was, Lives Bound Together, um, Washington's World, um, and it was oh, an award-winning, beautiful, beautiful um, exhibit. and. Again, we, we met the people where they were. The people were still very, very much in, interested in the material culture and material wealth and possessions. <laughs> so we had um, this exhibit and it starts off with the front parlor. It starts off with like a dining room, I believe it is. And there's a beautiful map of, of the world and it shows the directions of the transatlantic slave trade and you know where Washington are, are getting these people from? Where are these enslaved persons coming from? What regions um, in the continent of Africa are they coming from? And everything like that. And it it, it starts off. It, there's a beautiful punch bowl, and most people don't think about the contents that were inside of that punch bowl are just as important as the punch bowl itself. And so you're getting the rum in there, and the sugar that's in there. Where's that rum coming from? You know, who's cultivating that? Where's that sugar coming from? Who's cultivating that? And how did they get there to where they are? And then it moved over to the dining room, you know, setting and you have, you know, a beautiful um, coffee pot there. And you see the silhouette, um, a beautiful composite um, silhouette of Frank Lee as the butler, you know, serving the coffee. And the Washingtons were absent from, you know, for most of it, but, you know, except for like a painting on the back of the wall. So we are drawing people back into the interest, you know, um, educating by, by means of the entrance of, you know, their curiosity in the material world, again, possessions, possessions, possessions. And I thought, you know, 
coveting stuff was one of the deadly sins. Anyway, um, <laughs> but if you can get them in to like look at a place setting or get them in to look at some linens or some jewelry, you know, and then kind of, you know, go back out again to where was this, you know, gotten from? Who were the people that were responsible for cleaning it and caring for it and things of that particular sort? Um, that's also a way that we can um, gather their interest and then take the story beyond that. Um, because at the end of that exhibit, which is now available virtually online, so everybody that is watching this, you can go on this afterwards and, and go through the museum exhibit yourselves. Um, <laughs> but the end portion of that beautiful exhibit are testimonials or interviews by some of the descendants of these enslaved persons. So you get to hear them in their own words and their own thoughts of how they thought about the man, about the institution, about what even what the, you know, the Ladies Association is doing here to represent, you know, as part of their, their legacy as well. So. Well, I think that's um, a wonderful response to this question when you interpret how do you help guests see events from the time period instead of a 2021 lens. Um, any any additional points on that, Brendan? This is uh, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, and, you know, whoever wrote it, like, I love talking about this. And I'm going to answer it in a way that's probably going to make you be like, really? But really, like, how? How, how could you ever see anything from a lens that isn't 20, 21st century lens? Like that's, that's who we are. And so, you know, history is not about what happened 200 years ago. History is about our interpretation of what happened 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't, then there'd be no such thing as a new historian, right? Because with each new generation of historians, we are looking at the past and we are trying to derive meaning from it that has some resonance with us today. And it's not possible for us to remove ourselves from that lens, but we can try to understand it a little bit, you know, and I love the idea, you know, the past is a foreign country. When we think about things like uh, moral relativism within different cultures. We can think about that in terms of time, but morality hasn't really changed in this regard. And we can see that when we can see when Jefferson and Washington are struggling with knowing what they're do is, doing was morally wrong and that there were so many people around them and Franklin himself in later years saying, this is morally wrong, this needs to stop. Mm -hmm. And so even viewing it through an 18th century, early 19th century lens, we can see that the moral struggle is still there. Uh, and so I think that the idea is to try and engage with people to have these very abstract conversations. Uh, one of the things that I, I find somewhat uh, challenging sometimes is that you know people will say, well, visitors don't want to have those conversations. Yes, they do. That's why they're there. And they totally want to engage in, in a bizarre, abstract conversation about whether or not it's possible to remove yourself from the 21st century lens with which you view everything. So the answer is no. Right. But it's a great way to get into it. And I, I, I love just talking to people about that. And, and to further, you know, some of what Brenda said, we, we're doing the same stuff at Monticello. We spent the last five years restoring physical spaces on the mountaintop that are directly tied to the people who were enslaved there. And so much about history and memory that gets to this point is about what people choose to remember and choose to preserve. And in the 19th century and the early 20th century, when places like Mount Vernon and Monticello were being preserved by white historians, they tore down slave quarters because they didn't want to remember that. And so it's our job now to bring back some of the history that was removed because of the processes of racism and power that were so dominant throughout the early 20th century. And so it's going to be an ongoing struggle to try and remove some of those things in the years ahead so that we all might have a better understanding about what happened. To Brenda's point, the single narrative is problem, problematic. Like if you're looking at just one narrative, then you're never really going to understand the past. We can't have an objective understanding of the past but we can have a more diverse and a more inclusive understanding of the past. And in so doing, that might get us a little bit closer to knowing what was actually going on. Well said, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. Yeah, well, said. well, we have two questions, which are gonna you know, be fantastic questions uh, to have our final portion of our conversation around uh, before I flag the events that are coming up um, over the next two days, two more great sessions in the symposium. So the first question, I'm just going to read them as is. Um, if you had an unlimited budget, 
how would you enhance, change, further develop your interpretive programs on slavery? And we all wish we had an unlimited budget. Mary Scott Fleming, yes, we do. And um, we are all very grateful for your support. Um, and then we have another great question, which is really picking up this theme, um, which is these two questions, um, Mary and uh, the other viewer and listener has picked up what I wanted to ask uh, to close, which is as interpretation has moved from ignoring the enslaved communities to creating separate theme tours to incorporate enslaved experiences into general tours and interpretation, what's next? So both looking at the future. We know where we are. We've, we've, um, each of your institutions have made some great strides. Great strides. Where do you go from here? Mm. Thank you, Eric, for that question. I'll take the budget question. <laughs> Unlimited budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, we'll leave you with the other one. Um, if I had, if we had unlimited resources, how would I expand? Um, I would try to percentage wise, probably um, match the population of the persons that were here on the estate at, at the time of Washington's death um, to make it more, more equal to the 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 representation the actual representation of the bodies that were here um when i'm informing guests as to how many enslaved persons there were on the property and i say 317 and they go what <laughs> and then they ask well where are the rest of you <laughs> it's always where are the rest of you um you know and, and you know and i'll explain it's like well we're spread apart you know five different farms this is just one farm but here on this farm there's 80 90 different enslaved persons about a staff of 20 hired white persons and a family of five one of which is an infant um <laughs> <laughs> Do you really need, you know, 10, you know, people inside of the mansion to attend to a family and five, one of them being an infant? Um, <laughs> and so um, that particular thing, I would definitely increase um, staffing as far as representation there is concerned. And that also includes the hired people that were here in the different occupants. Occup occupations you know we need some overseers around here you know some tailors and what what have you and things of that sort the other thing that i would do which is very very mm, something that is extremely needed if you are a black person and you are intent interpreting somebody and that was enslaved we need more um mental health services and more support as far as that's concerned, because that is something that psychological um, confrontation, that psychological damage and the traumatic experiences that are brought up every single day, every time that you're here interpreting is something that is not healthy for any individual to constantly be put in that particular position, especially since we know that so much in the world has not changed as far as the constant injustices, the inhumanity that's inflicted upon us daily, just while occupying the skin that we happen to be in. So that's what I do with all that magic money. And so um, I need sponsors, people start making donations now. Thank you. <laughs> That's a great call out, Brenda. Thank you, Brendan. So uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take the other one, uh, and I think that uh, you know, thank you for saying all of that, Brenda, because it's true. Uh, it is one thing to have to talk about slavery all the time. It seems like increasingly uh, now people who do this work have to defend why they're talking about slavery all the time at a slave plantation. And it's, it's mind boggling uh, and it's ongoing in ways that are, are more aggressive than have been in the past. And I think that the question of, you know, the evolving uh, incorporation of stories of slavery has been ongoing at Monticello for as long as I've been there. 
uh, and, and so well before. Uh, and the restoration of physical spaces and incorporating stories of enslaved people throughout uh, the physical experience of visiting Monticello has been a decades long process. Uh, and over the past few years, a major restoration project, the Mountaintop Restoration Project, would restore so many physical spaces for enslaved people uh, that visiting Monticello today is a completely different experience than what it was 20 years ago. And as part of that, of course, there's an exhibit on the life of Sally Hemings that's in one of the spaces where she very likely lived. And uh, just next door to it is a physical exhibition on the Getting Word African American Oral History Project, which is a project that's in its 28th year, uh, my colleague Andrew Davenport is going to be talking about with this symposium on Friday. And those stories are so many, in so many ways, the stories of what Monticello means. And uh, to underscore another of Brenda's points, one of my colleagues, uh, Naya Bates, she says uh, that, you know, in, in many ways, these, these places are black spaces. And it's important to remember that, that, you know, the majority of people, the vast majority of people who called Monticello home when Thomas Jefferson lived there were enslaved African-Americans. And the thing that I'm, I'm most proud to have been a part of uh, is that uh, that future is now. The primary guided tour of Monticello is no longer a tour of a house. The primary guided tour of Monticello is a tour that incorporates pieces of the plantation and the South Wing. And everybody who takes a guided tour at Monticello ends in the kitchen yard looking at those exhibits on the life of Sally Hemings and on uh, conversations about the Getting Word African American Oral History Project. And that has been uh, in process for four or five years now that we've been working on it. COVID was very challenging, but it, it did in some ways give us an opportunity to reset. And so that is what we're trying to do and making sure that uh, while it has long been part of the process at Monticello that every tour you take talks about slavery, mm -hmm. now every tour you take is gonna physically take you to places of enslavement that were primarily occupied by enslaved people. Thank you. This is a theme that's going to continue tomorrow, Historic Sites uh, Interpreting Slavery, which will be at 12 noon Easter time, 5 p.m. Uh, British summer time. And Dr. Laura Sandy, who is the senior lecturer in the history of slavery and co-director of the Center for the Study of International Slavery at the University of Liverpool, will lead a discussion about interpreting slavery at historic sites on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, that will feature Dr. Christo Kefalas, who's World Cultures uh, Curator for the UK's National Trust, Dr. Antoinette Jackson, who's Professor and Chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of South Florida, and John Francis Manicom, who's the Curator at the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool. And it's going to be really focusing in on some of the themes that we've discussed this evening about presenting slavery at public history sites. On Friday, again, uh, taking up some of the themes in more detail that we've covered this evening, public memory and oral history at the same times, uh, you will be able to hear uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, who is the author of On Juneteenth, and she's the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Hemingses of Monticello. She'll be leading a panel discussion about the importance of oral histories in understanding how individuals and communities experience the forces of history. Andrew Davenport, who is public historian and manager of Getting Word, the African American Oral History Project will discuss Getting Word's nearly 20 year history and how descendants are getting word to us today about their lives, their families, and their dreams. Uh, Justin Reed is the director of those community initiatives at Virginia Humanities, and he's also the co-founder of the Lemon Project, which is looking at the history of slavery at the College of William and Mary. That session on Friday is also going to feature Alan Rice, who's professor of English and American Studies at the University of Central Lancashire here in the United Kingdom. And he's also co-director of the Institute for the Black Atlantic Research uh, Project and director of um, the U.S. Clan, Lancashire Research Center in Migration, Diaspora, and Exile. And together they're going to be discussing the importance of learning from the past to grapple with the issues that face us today. If you've missed any of the sessions that have taken place uh, since the beginning of this week, please uh, visit www.monticello.org uh, forward slash TSS 
And you can also visit Benjamin Franklin House's YouTube channel or on the Benjamin Franklin House Twitter account. Um, so let me just close by saying thank you so much to the colleagues at um, Monticello, at Mount Vernon, and my own colleagues at Benjamin Franklin House for the fabulous session today, and particularly to Brendan Dillard and to Brenda Parker. Thank you.